a very special event. As you know, um, tonight at the City Hall, we have the promotion, amongst other things, of our honorary doctors. And we also have an installation of new professors and, of course, uh, the former PhD students that become officially doctors of philosophy or doctors of technology. So within that, KTH promotes uh, every year a number of uh, distinguished academics from different fields, either from natural sciences, humanities, social sciences, or both. And I can just say my name is Tigran Haas. I am the director of the Center for the Future of Places, which is placed in the School of Architecture and the Built Environment. And we have been uh, the entity that has been behind the sort of uh, um, one of the candidates' uh, uh, honorary doctors. And that is, of course, Professor uh, Richard Florida. So I'm very happy today that we've been able to put this seminar together uh, with a number of also distinguished uh, uh, scholars from KTH and colleagues that will also be part of the panel and we'll have a discussion following uh, Richard's talk. And also, I would like to say that this seminar is a cooperation between, um, I call it RISE, uh, or it's RISE, or it's RI.SE, a uh, very interesting uh, uh, sort of a, a research support body at KTH, and also the Viable Cities huge platform that we have here. So if you want to look those two up, I really suggest, and also our center's web pages, www.cfp.ab.kth.se. Um, some of us are jet lagged, which is fine, we just came from the US. But I want to say one thing about KTH, which I think it's important, and I know some of your, our alumni, some of our colleagues here, I spent the last month at MIT in one of the labs there, and I can tell you that you know we're now developing different partnerships with MIT, and MIT is extreme. Uh, uh, we are ver valued very high in MIT's eyes. So I think that, that tells a lot about KTH. So I think we should all be proud when we go out and when we're here, uh, not just to promote KTH, but that really this is a premier institute of technology. And I know I've br given one brand to it, I call it the MIT of the North, and it's been sort of taken, and I know our president calls it simply the best. So maybe both of them we can combine. So anyway, uh, without any further ado, uh, I would like to introduce um, uh, and just tell you how this is going to go. Introduce our first, our honorary speaker. It's going to be Dr. Richard Florida, and it will be followed by a panel of uh, our three colleagues. So um, I will introduce the panel later when Richard gives his talk of about 35 to 40 minutes. And then after that, we'll have a discussion and reflections in the panel. So Richard Florida is one of the world's, world's leading urbanists. He's a researcher and professor serving as a university professor at the University of Toronto School of Cities and Rotman School of Management, as well as being distinguished fellow at NYU and Florida International University. And he's been before professor also at Carnegie Mellon. A writer and journalist, uh, having penned, as you can see the poster behind me, uh, the several extremely influential books and also papers that have really started to turn and change the paradigms how we see at the cities. And two paradigms that you have seen here that are both in work, as I would like to say. Uh, the book, The New Urban uh, Crisis, the last one be before it was The Rise of the Creative Class that I think a lot of you have read and it has in your possession. Uh, also the senior editor of The Atlantic and the City Lab, one of the most prolific, I would say, um, prolific uh, debate sites, news sites on issues of urbanism. Uh, and really that has been stable for almost over a decade. Um, he's also an entrepreneur and founder of the Creative Class Group that does some amazing work around uh, the US and of course he's one of the most respected people, one of the senior advisors to so many mayors in the US and uh, even maybe future politicians on the, on the highest level. Uh, but he's also a, a super guy, so I'm very happy to call him my friend and colleague uh, and we're really uh, appreciative and as I said, uh, those of you that have followed throughout the years, KTH has really attracted the best of the best. So, enough about KTH, right? But I draw the line there. So, uh, if you want to find more about Richard, you can also go onto the Creative Class webpage and also the University of Toronto. So, with no further ado, I don't think I've forgotten anything. Uh, I will give the word to Richard for uh, the honorary doc doctorate uh, speech at our school and our university. Welcome, Richard. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, thank you, Tigran, um, for that very, very kind introduction. Uh, and thank you for stewarding my, uh, my nomination. 
uh, and acceptance this evening of an honorary doctorate um, from this. I, I mean, it, it was, it's quite an honor. That, that's what I'll say. It's, this is quite a prestigious institute, not only in Sweden, uh, but all across the world. So I am really honored uh, to accept it. And I look forward to the day, and I look forward to this evening. Um, I think I want to tell you my story, and, and it will get to the creative class in the new urban crisis. But I, I think since we don't know one another, and in fact in Sweden before I've given kind of a standard speech about my book, books, um, I'll tell you my story and, and where they, and particularly since at least a subset of you uh, are graduate students and doctoral students and embarking on a journey that's similar to, to the one I did. So the basic fact of me uh, that you could use to extrapolate all of this, it, it comes down to one single and simple fact. I was born in Newark, New Jersey. Um, that's the airport that got me here yesterday. Uh, have any of you flown to that airport or been in Newark? It's a hub of Scandinavian Airlines. Uh, but the thing you should know about Newark is it's probably the single most distressed urban community in the United States and perhaps in the advanced industrial world. And that's the city of my birth. Uh, I was born in 1957, and as a young boy, uh, my city was a vibrant city. Um, a, a great writer, now retired, named Philip Roth, if you read his works, they're all about Newark. When I was a young boy, I'm Italian-American, there was a large and bustling community of Italian-Americans a large and bustling community of Jewish Americans, a large and bustling community of African Americans. Um, there were, believe it or not, integrated schools. My mother went to one. Um, the city uh, was home to a downtown central business district with great department stores. It had a vibrant, it was one of the origins of the Industrial Revolution in the United States, a so-called ironbound district right abutting the airport if you fly in. The ironbound district is an area of manufacturing, historical manufacturing, uh, it was called Ironbound, so-called, because it was bounded by train tracks and the port. Um, but by the 1960s, if, if you study urbanism and urban history in the United States, our, our, our cities, less so cities in Europe, our cities in the United States, I think somewhat uniquely, uh, began to depopulate. Um, at first, uh, people, prompted by mortgage subsidies, federal highway subsidies, road subsidies, uh, begin to leave the cities to move to the suburbs. In a very famous book in 1961, Hoover and Vernon, two famous urban economists, uh, uh, called Anatomy of a Metropolis. The metropolis they were looking at was New York, my metropolis, New York is part of it, um, said that we were experiencing, think about this, a flight from density. Not a flight to density, a flight from density. Um, as the middle class, white Americans, uh, began to depopulate the cities, business and industry followed. Uh, uh, factories began to relocate from their older vertical factories to more horizontal factories. Uh, commerce began to relocate, downtown department stores began to close, they began to create the shopping malls that we've all come to know and maybe not love so much. Um, um, my dad worked in a factory in the ironbound section, my mom worked in the local newspaper, the Star Ledger in downtown Newark. Uh, my parents in the early 60s also became suburban migrants. Uh, they followed, my mother had six sisters. Um, my mother uh, followed her, she's the youngest of the girls, she followed her next youngest sister. They found a small town in New Jersey uh, called North Arlington, and they're very close to Newark, two or three miles, and they moved there uh, for a very basic reason. It had very good schools, were Catholic, they had very good Catholic schools a very hard discipline, and my parents and her sister wanted what was best for their kids, the so-called American dream of upward mobility. Well, we moved to this town, and um, I was a very precocious kid. Um, my parents wanted me to succeed. I, I wasn't that interested in education, to be quite candid. Uh, as a child growing up in the 60s, the influences on me were things like the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Eric Clapton, Jeff Beck, and Jimi Hendrix. I begged my parents to buy me a guitar. And for a guy who worked in a factory with a seventh grade education like my father, that was a heavy lift. 
Uh, my dad bought me a guitar and an amplifier. He brought my younger brother a drum kit, and we had bands. That's what I did with my life. That's what I was supposed to be. Huh. Um, anyway, my dad made a deal with me. The deal was, if I was going to play guitar, I was going to study music, not just learn by ear, and learn the music of my day. And in addition to that, at taking guitar lessons, I was going to spend time in the library. <laughs> why it's so appropriate here. In the library, going, even though my dad didn't have an education, wished he had an education, uh, scanning the books and learning to read, and read literature. Well, one day, on a Saturday, uh, my dad, uh, because he was a factory worker, that was his day off, was taking me to my guitar lesson and to the Newark Library. My deal. And we were driving from North Arlington. If you don't know the drive, there's a very easy way, if you haven't seen it, if you open up the video of The Sopranos, any episode, that's the exact drive. That is going, Tony is going to my hometown, reverse it. When he goes over, that's the Pulaski Skyway, the Pizza Land Pizzeria, that is in my hometown, the Bada Bing Club is on the other end of my hometown, that was the drive into downtown Newark, and we heard bang, bang, bang. My dad, who had served in... World War II knew what we were hearing, I didn't. There were gunshots. And, and my dad said, Rich, pretty calmly, get down on the floor. They're shooting at us. Um, and as we looked around, it became quite evident, and as we went home and looked at the news, that Newark had exploded into racial riots. Um, as we exited the city and the police moved us out, you could see not only police vehicles, but military vehicles occupying my city and you could see storefronts in the commercial districts on flame. Now, I was a nine or 10-year-old kid at the time. It was 1967. I didn't say to my dad, you know, Dad, I want to become an urbanist and study urban planning. But something went off in my brain that day. That was the old urban crisis. That's what I was forged into. As a 10-year-old kid trying to make sense of the world, I was witnessing the old urban crisis of depopulation, deindustrialization, ethnic and racial and civic strife, civil disobedience, rioting. Uh, so I went on with my life. You know, I said, I'm going to be a rock and roll guitar player. I grew my hair down on my ass. You know, I had earrings. I had all sorts of jewelry. You know, I'm a contemporary. Bruce Springsteen's a little older. John Bon Jovi's about my age. They're pretty good, and they had good bands. And, um, you know, working class kid, I talk like this. How you doing? It's nice here to be. Hey, Tigran, it's good to see you, brother. You know, and, and then I swear to God, one day I got a Garden State scholarship to go to Rutgers, which had a great planning department, where I learned English as a second language. That was the thing that really happened in Rutgers. I learned how to speak English without this kind of accent. So um, I went to Rutgers. I got this Garden State scholarship, still thinking about whether I'm going to play music, what I'm going to do. Well, I'm Italian-American, the first kid in my family to go to school. Uh, my parents said, <laughs> you're going to be a doctor. Not, and not a doctor of philosophy, you're going to be a medical doctor. And uh, they said, well, you should take calculus and chemistry and physics and biology and pre-medical courses. And for the first time in my life, I got straight horrible grades. And I had always gotten good grades. And um, I came home at the holiday time, and I knew I had to change something. And uh, I asked my parents, I said, you know, I want to change my major. And uh, mom and dad didn't like this. They called a meeting. The meeting literally had about as many people as are in here in a little ha town in New Jersey. They called, remember, I have seven aunts and uncles on both sides, so that's 14 when you multiply by spouses. That was 28 aunts and uncles and probably 50, 60 cousins all crowded into our little house to tell me to buck up and go back to medical education. And I started to cry a little bit, and I said, no, I don't want to do that, and I had my answer. I said, I'm going to be a lawyer, and my mom liked that answer. She said, okay, that's fine, that's another good profession. And the next term, sophomore term, coming back after the holiday break, I took a portfolio of courses in the social sciences. I took a course in history, I took a course in political science, I took a course in economics. Those were all introduction. Geography, the geography of the course, they didn't have an introductory course being offered, but they had a course in urban geography. So I took that course. Um, now an 18-year-old kid, and uh, the course was eye-opening. Of course, I was doing well in all these social science courses, but the professor, his name is Bob Lake. Bob is 
still very active. He runs the PhD program at Rutgers. And uh, Bob Lakes get, said to us, I see you have this notebook. He, he gave us a notebook like yours. Uh, and he gave us a set of instructions. And the instructions were to take the Amtrak train from New Brunswick, New Jersey, which was on the commuter line, not far, 20 miles from New York City, take the train into Manhattan, get off at Penn Station, take the notebook, he put in it a little guided tour, and go and chronicle what we saw. Well, this is 1976 in New York City, the golden age, right, that we all read about. It was filled with hippies and beatniks and professors with berets and artists. You know, when I was walking from Penn Station down through Chelsea in the meatpacking district, which still was a meatpacking district, and there were factories in Tribeca, and artists were squatting in the factories, and the factory people were bitching at the artists, and Greenwich Village had all this energy in the early punk movement, and you saw people with this spiked hair, and you're like, oh, this isn't Newark. It's literally six miles away. There was some kind of thing happening there that I, I had thought of a city as decline and desperation and despair and dysfunction. Now I filed that all away. I wrote this di uh, dissertation. If any of you want to do an exercise in really brutalizing your mind, you should read it. It was this horribly turgid, neo-Marxist, I remember my mother saying like, what, she tried to read it, she's like, what is this mumbo jumbo? Like, this is, you're not even making sense, and there's no, I can't get your point. It was this analysis of the old Ehrman crisis filled with jargon, and, and off I went. I became a professor at Ohio State, um, and in 1987, moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So the first formative thing that was me was Newark and New York, forging me in the old urban crisis, giving me a love for cities, and in my mind, and I think in the mind of most people working in the field, cities were really places of dysfunction, particularly in the United States. Dysfunction and despair. Centers of concentrated poverty. You know, when I was graduating um, high school, New York, uh, New York City went bankrupt. You know, President Ford at the time uh, said to New York City, go drop dead. A famous headline in the New York papers, go drop dead, we're not going to bail you out, you're on your own. Bankruptcy. And so cities were places of dysfunction, of despair, and uh, now that shaped my worldview. I end up in Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh at the time is my second life lesson. Um, Pittsburgh at the time was going through the throes not only of urban despair, but of regional economic despair. Um, it was the, if Newark was the single most impoverished and remains, the single most impoverished city, Pittsburgh had been dealt with the biggest economic body blow. Uh, a center of steel and of heavy industry. Um, the city was really hit by a series of economic crises in the 1970s and early 1980s, which decimated its industrial base. Uh, before I came, the city lost hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs. A city whose population was once nearly one million saw that population fall to 330,000. It lost two-thirds of its people. Um, it was really in the throes of economic devastation. But there's a very famous economic geographer there who helped me get my job. His name is Gordon Clark. Gordon just retired as the McIntyre Professor of Geography at Oxford. Um, at the time, uh, there was a, a thought in Pittsburgh, led by the president of the university, Carnegie Mellon, where I, where I took up a professorship and was for nearly 20 years. His name was Richard Seyert. He's a famous social scientist. The idea that Richard Seyert had was that Carnegie Mellon, <coughs> an institution not unlike this one, KTH, that Carnegie Mellon held the seeds to Pittsburgh for the revitalization. And here was the hypothesis that Richard Seyert had. At Carnegie Mellon, if you looked, in terms of the technologies that were being developed, robotics, probably the leading center of robotics in the world to this day, a software and software engineering, early computer and science, internet search. This is me in 1984. You're at KTH, you're at a place like this. 1987, I mean. 1987, I come to Carnegie Mellon. My colleagues tell me, Richard, we are going to have ubiquitous computing anytime, anyplace, anywhere. I didn't even use email. We're going to have ubiquitous computing that when you go in a room, it will sense your temperature, it will know, 
We had guys, I wear a Fitbit, we had guys back then making something called body media, body trackers. We had self-driving cars. Pittsburgh's now become a center of self-driving cars. We had self-driving tanks. We had robots. The future was there, and what Richard Seyert and others hypothesized, and I think they knew, these technologies could fuel an economic rebirth. And in fact, when we did the analysis, on a per faculty member basis or per research dollar basis, Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon were producing as much patents and staffing as many startup companies as Stanford University was, the hub company of the Silicon, hub, hub institution, catalytic institution of the Silicon Valley, or MIT was doing in the Boston region. Even more so, although Pittsburgh had lost the manufacturing branch plants of these companies, it had the R&D centers of all the major steel companies, which had suburbanized, they had built these beautiful suburban research and development parks, but remember, Pittsburgh wasn't just the center of steel. Pittsburgh really was the Silicon Valley of 100 years ago. The Mellons family were early, early venture capitalists and were investing in related clusters of companies that would complement and diversify their steel investments. George Westinghouse Company's famous electric company was there. Westinghouse had a huge R&D center, one of the best in the world at the time. Uh, Pittsburgh had a huge community of companies in chemicals. Pittsburgh plate glass, Pittsburgh chemicals. It had uh, switches and signals. It had uh, advanced technology around Rockwell Aerospace. The idea was if you could glue those two together, the industrial research capacity and the university research capacity, you could build a cluster of high technology industry similar to what was happening in the Silicon Valley or in the suburbs of Boston. Look, we invented the world's first high technology network. We brought together the first network in the world of high technology enterprise. We called it the Pittsburgh High Technology Council. We invented the first statewide program, Pennsylvania's Ben, ben Franklin program, to connect university and industry and support them with funding. We created the first entrepreneurial incubators in the world, at least now all over the world. We created the first programs for technology transfer from university to industry. And we began spinning off companies. If you looked around Carnegie Mellon at the time, my colleagues ran the research divisions of Microsoft, of Apple, of Google. Our students were going to the best corporations, high-tech companies out in the Bay Area. We were a catalyst, but we weren't benefiting. The idea was, could we begin to spin some of these companies off and create a cluster, Michael Porter's idea, a cluster of related high-tech companies in Pittsburgh? Well, this was going well, and I had spent 10 years at Carnegie Mellon University, so after 10 years in the trenches, I was eligible for a sabbatical leave. Um, and as Tigran was just mentioning, he just came back from Boston, uh, at the time, at the Harvard Kennedy School and at MIT, there were a group of scholars very interested in how do you rebuild re deindustrializing Rust Belt regions like Pittsburgh. And a group of them at MIT's Industrial Performance Center, in fact, led by Richard Lester, who's now the Vice Provost for Global Affairs at MIT. And at Harvard, a group of physicists and scientists at Harvard who had aligned themselves with the Kennedy School, Harvey Brooks, um, who's the person who built applied engineering and physics at Harvard. Lou Branscombe, the former Vice President of, of uh, Research and Development at IBM, uh, a famous physicist. Uh, the fellow who was Director of Research at NASA. We put together a seminar, and the seminar wasn't urban planners and social scientists. It was a seminar of the leading physicists and biologists and chemists and urbanists and uh, economists. This was like the Nobel Prize dinner. I'm not kidding you. It was a collection of Nobel Prize winning level scientists allayed with social scientists to figure out a blueprint to use science and technology to revitalize dying manufacturing places. And Pittsburgh was our base case. And one day, you know, if the, if the riot shaped me early, this day helped shape me later, I was driving into Cambridge and parked in the, the lot at the Kennedy School and got my cup of espresso and the Boston Globe is a local paper. And I opened up the Boston Globe to a headline. I write about that in Rise of the Creative Class that changed my life. And the headline read, see, we had spun out many companies, but of one of these companies was a competitor to Google. Uh, even though our people were at Google <laughs> and helping to build Google, we had people in all of these companies. 
Uh, Yahoo was another one. We had created a third company. We were very good at internet search. Actually, Carnegie Mellon was very good at video search, very good at search. Um, and Eric Schmidt at the time, that, that's, I got to know him. He spent a lot of time at Carnegie Mellon before he went to Google. And uh, this company was organizing internet search, and it was a big deal. And uh, it was a competitor of Google, it was a competitor of Yahoo, it was one of the big companies in that then exploding field. We had put two of our best professors to found it. We had built the management team together. We had uh, arrayed our best graduate students. We spun that company off. It was located adjacent to the university in a cool industrial area right down the street. It was growing like gangbusters. And the headline in the Boston Globe read that this company was moving from Pittsburgh to Boston. And as my mother would have said, it threw me for a loop. Threw me for a real loop. Why was our company moving to Boston? Now, if you know anything about urban economics, you know that, that what urban economics was about and what I taught about in urban economic development was that firms drive economic development. And that firms, if you could attract firms or build clusters of firms, if you could lure them to your city, bribe, tax incentive, whatever, you could attract firms to your city, firms were key, they would bring jobs and people would move to jobs because, of course, people as rational actors go where wages are higher. Now, Pittsburgh had a natural advantage. Compared to Boston, compared to San Francisco, it was cost effective. It was cheap. So we could bring the high technology jobs combined with the low cost of living. Look at, whoa, whoa, what? Why was the company moving from Pittsburgh to Boston? Boston had higher cost of labor. It had higher cost of business. It had higher cost of office space. It had a higher cost of ta housing. It had higher taxes. The whole equation was effed up. Sorry, almost slipped. Backward. Um, and I couldn't figure it out. I'm literally, I'm like, what in the hell is happening to my town? So I went on an investigative exploration. I called the people at the company, called people at Carnegie Mellon, got my best students to form a research team around this. And when we dug into this, the reason the company was moving they got no incentives for Boston, they got no financial assistance, they got no tax break. They were willing to pay much higher costs. The reason they were moving to Boston was one reason. The skilled and talented people they needed to build the company, not just in R&D, but in marketing and management, whatever disciplines were already living in Boston, it was taking them too long to bring these people to Pittsburgh, and oftentimes they wouldn't move. So here's the thing that went off in my head, the big aha that maybe firms weren't the only unit of analysis that matters to the economic development of places. Maybe there was a secondary factor, us. Maybe, I said to myself, human location decisions matter as much or maybe more. I didn't know. I posed the question, how much does human location decision making, how much does your location decision making affect regional growth and development? And I scanned the literature. Do you know how many papers were written on that? And I had a colleague at, at Carnegie Mellon named Herb Simon, probably the greatest 20th century scientist, a Nobel Prize, an early Nobel Prize winner in economics, uh, also made fundamental advances in philosophy, invented, helped invent, one of the three peoples invented artificial uh, intelligence, modern philosophy, linguistic philosophy. Um, <laughs> helped invented the field of cognitive psychology. I mean, Herb was a polymath. Herb said, Richard, when you find a research question that no one else has asked, that sits at the nexus of several disciplines, go for that. It's likely to pay off. Don't just chase the research. He said, if you find one, if you're lucky enough to find one, he said, I was lucky enough I found several, because he's Herb. But if you find one, go for it. And I went and met with him. He said, just go for this. So I began, and, and the way I began is when I went back to Carnegie Mellon, I had a group of students just like you, and I said to the students, how many of you, when you graduate this great institution, there were engineering students, we had a program in engineering and public policy, there were business students, there were public policy students, urban-oriented students, how many of you plan to stay in Pittsburgh? And like one hand went up. And I said, why? And they said, what if you got a job with one, oh no, we get jobs in Pittsburgh all the time. What do you mean? And, and they pay well, well why don't you, you stay here? Well, it's not exciting. It doesn't have a buzz. It doesn't have energy. And I'm so stupid, I'm thinking energy. They, they all want low gas, uh, gas and electric prices. Like, what are these people talking about? And we went down the list of the factors 
And it became evident that the, the things that were weighing on their location choices were different than just economic adjustment, uh, wage rates, and housing costs. There were a whole set of what Ed, our dear friend Ed Glazer would call non-market factors, what economists have now, later in the game, come to call amenities. Amenities, in their words, which mattered. So, so I said, well, let me try to figure this out. So one day I'm walking down the hall, and my dean at the time says to me, you should meet a guy named Gary Gates. I'm like, sure, I like people. I'll meet Gary Gates. He said, because you guys are studying the same thing. Oh, really? I'm one of the few people in the world studying this, I think. I hadn't even met Ed at the time. Ed was just starting off as a professor. And uh, he said, yeah, Gary's studying the location decisions of gay men. What are, you, what are you, from the freaking moon? What does this have to do with what I'm doing? So he said, just meet me, Gary. So I go meet Gary, and Gary's great. He's a, a, a lab seminarian. He's dropped out of the priesthood. He's a fantastic guy. Uh, he's got a great sense of humor, because when you work on... And the reason he was studying the location decisions of gay men, because he was trying to get a handle on the propagation of AIDS. And, you know, we didn't have statistics on where gay men were located. So he had invented something called the Gay Index, which he created an algorithm uh, which could look at census data and, and derive, although this question wasn't asked, where gay male households are. And what the hypothesis he had come up with is that gay male households were strongly concentrated in certain cities and metro areas with a high level of amenity. And when we met, he said, Rich, name your, I didn't come up with the name. The name creative class came from a really smart editor, a New York book editor. I was calling it all sorts of BS. And I said, if you have a class here, if it looks like a class, smells like a class, call it a class. And I was, but anyway. Uh, Gary said, name your five hotspots for the high-tech think workers. Well, I said, that's, you know, Boston and Seattle and San Francisco and San Diego and where else. And he said, you've just named the five gayest places in America, Rich. So we did the research. And, of course, to our surprise, there was strong and positive and significant correlations between these clusters of, of gay men and the clusters of what we come to call the creative class and high-tech industry and higher incomes. The second thing we did was we had a center for census research at Carnegie Mellon at the time. There's a very capable guy there. And we were trying to look at proximate measures for amenities. Um, and people were talking about like concerts, uh, music, uh, entertainment, um, musical shows, all these sorts of things. And in the census, there is another category of people that let you actually count the number of working actors and musicians and people in these fields. We created a Bohemian Index. And also to our, and now this was a joke. Like, this isn't even serious. Like, we're going, gays and Bohemians, and we're going, like, people are going to think we're nuts, right? They're just going to think we're crazy, we lost the plot. But this, and these guys are really good econometricians and data scientists. And the correlations and associations, no matter what we control for, are coming out positive and significant. So anyway, we start writing this stuff. And uh, I write the book, The Rise of the Creative Class, published in 2002. And uh, just to make a long story very short, we, we, we then, at the urging of my editor, this group of people that we were identifying as think workers, knowledge workers, I did two things. I did a historical analysis and a cross-section. And we did a historical analysis going back about 200 years in the United States, sending kids, graduate students, to the library to hand code the census data by occupation. In the United States, we identify work. And to be quite blunt, I was very dissatisfied with educationally-based measures. Um, the, the truth is that I am trained as a neo-Marxist. And in my youth, I, I spent a lot of time reading Marx, like it or not. When Marx talked about classes, he didn't talk about indicators like income levels or educational status. He talked about your relationship to the means of production. So I had a simple-minded idea that you could root people's class base. My dad was in the working class. He was a blue-collar worker. He was part of the proletariat. You could think about this new class structure by looking at occupations. In the United States, we have data on more than 800 of them. So as we began to parse these occupations into farming-based occupations and physically-based manufacturing locations, the working class, what came out is there were a series of knowledge-based occupations science and technology, innovation, research and development, entrepreneurship, arts, entertainment, and culture, that had an underlying skill set, that had a set of relationships to the means of production where you didn't use your physical labor, you used your mental labor. Your mental labor became part of the means of production. 
And so we looked at this data over time, and here's what we found. In the year 1900, most people were still farmers in Sweden and the United States. Less than 5% of the workforce were members of this group called the creative class, scientists, technologists, innovators, musicians, knowledge workers. By the year 1950, the United States and Sweden as well had become fully industrialized nations. At this time, more than half of the workforce were like people like my dad, working in factories. Less than 10% of the workforce were members of the creative class. Between 1980 and the year 1998, <laughs> which is the data we had at the time, the creative class in the United States grew by tens of millions. Um, at the time that I wrote the book, nearly 40 million Americans were members of the creative class, about a third of the workforce. Um, if you look at Sweden today, about 45 percent, 45 percent of your workforce are members of the creative class. This is as big as farming was to the Swedish economy in the 1850s and as manufacturing was to the Swedish economy in the 1950s. If you look at Stockholm, I think it's the second largest concentration of the creative class in Europe, in Northern Europe. Amsterdam is first. It's over 50%. And if you look at districts in this city, which are closer to the inner city, you're talking about 80 or 90% of the people working in the creative class. So that's, that's what we were, and simply wanted to document the rise of this new class uh, and its impact on society. Now, the book sunk like a stone. I had written eight books before it. Nobody read them. But something very strange happened. <laughs> Several months after the book came out, a guy who was editor of the Washington Monthly read the book. And somehow somebody failed to deliver their essay for that month's issue. And he said, you know, I grew up in St. Louis, and St. Louis is a lot like Pittsburgh. And everything I see in St. Louis looks like what you saw in Pittsburgh. Can I excerpt your book? His name was Paul Glaster. And he tells a story recently about how he had the patch and stitch things and make sentences, weave them together. He, and he said, he titled that story, not the creative class, he titled that story and the cover of the magazine, Why Cities with Gays and Rock Bands Will Win the Economic Development Race. Amazon was pretty new. Holy shit. I looked at my Amazon ratings and it went just like this. That story went viral. I didn't know, people said, you know, bloggers. I had no idea when they said the word blogger what they were. Bloggers are writing about your book, and boom. And that took off not just in the United States, it took off worldwide. And, and, and it was fascinating. That's a topic of another book. Um, but anyway, it became something that captured the imagination. And at that point, immediately it set off a firestorm. Uh, I'm a big boy. I'm an academic. I actually like criticism. Initially, if you have this happen to you, initially it hurts. I have to be honest. And, and some adjust better. Rob Putnam, if you read Rob Putnam's book, the epilogue to the book on bowling alone, he talks about what, what happens when you become a public intellectual and how you try to deal with it. It's very eloquent. Uh, but for me, I got criticism from both the left and the right. The right were the first, and they, they were, <laughs> let's say skeptical would be a nice word, skeptical of the fact that, that, that things like a gay index or a bohemian index had anything to do with economic affairs, and they immediately called me on the carpet. Does Florida really believe that yuppies, sophistos, trendoids, and gays drive economic development? One guy wrote, and I, I've become, since become friends with most of these people, um, it, it, one, one guy <laughs> literally wrote, his cat, Florida's trying to foist his gay agenda on America. I'm unfortunately heterosexual, but that's neither here nor there. Um, you know, and, and he's, the city sisters of Our Lady of St. Joseph, who taught me, would be rolling over the grave. He's trying to undermine Judeo-Christian civilization as we know it. From the left, of course, came a different criticism in two waves. The first criticism was he's nuts and he's all wrong. The creative class isn't a class. That was the first one. The working class is the class. Florida has lost its marbles. Look, these engineers and scientists and business people and media people and artists, they're all different. They wouldn't put them in a class. They're just, maybe they're part of the working class. No, they're not. Their minds are the means of production. Marx would have seen it. In fact, if you go back to the Grundrisse, Marx sees it and shows that there will be a different class, he argues, <laughs> where science and knowledge will become the means of production. But no, they don't fit. They fall out. They're contradictory. Uh, and that was the first one. And when the economic crisis comes, they will all go back to putting on suits and ties and living in suburbia. This, this urban bullshit that Florida is talking about is nuts. This will not happen. We're a suburban nation. It's distributed, industrially driven. And then as the <laughs> urban revitalization started to accelerate in the United States, there was a second wave of criticism. 
Florida's creative class is the architect of gentrification. Complete flip-flop. Now, Florida's creative class, and, and he has written the playbook. I wish I had a copy of the book. Here is the playbook that he's written for developers to gentrify our city. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, I, I'm simply trying to analyze what's happening in society. I, I, I'm not trying to... I have no relationship to it. And there's a great, science, a great social scientist at Harvard named Daniel Moynihan, and my father, in bringing me to that library, I read this as a kid, he wrote a book called Maximum Feasible Misunderstanding. And that book was about his work at Harvard and when it went into government in the Kennedy administration and the Nixon administration, and how that work was bungled and mangled and turned into political agendas, and I said, holy God, I'm going through a maximum feasible misunderstanding. That's fine. You propagate an idea out into the world, the idea finds its way, and people do with it what they wish, and you try to refine it and use that as a way to open up a conversation. There are lots more we can talk about. I want to get to the third part of the story. Uh, in 2007, I moved to Toronto, a place more like Stockholm than it is like Newark or San Francisco, a place which is progressive, which is kind, um, a country which has health care, good educational system, not a lot of guns, very little violence, a model for immigration and tolerance. Our mayor, a social democrat, and our lead counselor for economic development, a social democrat, they call them new democrats, same thing, are developing an agenda for inclusive prosperity in which I'm an advisor. I'm talking to Jane Jacobs. And out of this mix in Toronto the Good is elected the original populist, Rob Ford. You may have even heard of him in Stockholm. Rob Ford. Before Donald Trump, before the wave of populism, Rob Ford, the guy who ran his campaign on tearing out bike lanes, blaming the creative class for gentrification, the guy who was snorting crack on his mayoral desk. And I said to my wife, I said, if this can happen in Toronto, more and worse will follow. Because Toronto was a relatively egalitarian, a relatively well and cohesively organized society. You could see the rage building, you could see the anger building, you could see the division in our society. And that division, I think, is very important to understand. It is not simply a class division or a product of socioeconomic inequality, although those are key factors. It is a problem of geographic concentration, of geographic segregation, and geographic isolation, where the creative class, highly educated people, have colonized the areas close to the urban core, around transit, around knowledge-based institutions, of high amenity, and have packed themselves into these communities, an area which, a, a, a geographic structure, which I called winner-take-all urbanism. Winner-take-all urbanism. We live in a society now where the Stockholms, the Torontos, the New Yorks, the Berlins, the Londons, the Shanghais, the Beijings, the world isn't flat. Thomas Friedman said the world is flat. It's not flat, it's spiky. It's highly geographically concentrated, and we operate in one world, which is far apart from the other world where so many other people live. And as that has happened, that geographic segregation has happened, and we get not only economic inequality, but the more important factor, spatial inequality, urban-rural divide, whatever we want to call it, but it's fractal, it recurs at every scale, areas of persistent and concentrated advantage, a declining middle class surrounded by areas of large-scale persistent disadvantage, you get two worlds and two cultures. It's, and, and we know this from the studies of populism that we have. It's not so much that the old social democratic or labor solutions of economic equity will solve this. In fact, those solutions are being rejected. There is a cultural reaction in the centers of urban creativity, in these hub places, our values are cosmopolitan. We believe that our climate future is important to address. We believe that gay rights and women's rights are something that are critical. We believe in a good society that invests in public goods. <laughs> Out in other parts of the world, those are the things people resent. They are wedded to a more traditional kind of society. They believe in family values. And you can see this propagating. It wasn't just an economic conflict. It was a geographically mediated conflict over values. So that's what the new urban crisis was all about. How do we begin to address this in a new and more potent way? One of the big things 
and I could talk a long time about the New Urban Crisis. But one of the biggest things that really struck me in writing that book is that I grew up in a working class family that was middle class. And when we looked at the data, the data are a little less egregious for Sweden, but they're similar for the United States and Canada. When we looked at the data, about three quarters of Americans were not only middle class in the 1970s when I was growing up, about three quarters of Americans lived in middle class neighborhoods, which were the propellant for me to achieve upward mobility. In fact, if you read Raj Chetty's work, my parents moved from Newark, an area with one of the lowest levels of economic mobility, to North Arlington. It's in southern Bergen County. It's the it's the most working class and lowest income community. But Bergen County adjacent to Newark has one of the highest levels of socioeconomic mobility. I was lucky, got a Garden State scholarship. But that middle class neighborhood propelled me on a, a trajectory of upward mobility. Today, uh, in the United States, less than a third of Americans live in a middle class neighborhood. In 205 of 229 metros that the Pew Foundation studied, the middle class has declined dramatically. If the old urban crisis was about the movement of the middle class from the city to the suburbs, the new urban crisis at bottom is about winner-take-all urbanism, a small group of winners among cities and a small group of winning neighborhoods within cities, spatial inequality that's fractal, that recurs at every scale, but it's about the annihilation and evisceration of the middle class and middle class neighborhoods. And what we have, and I think you'd see it here in Sweden just as much, is very, very small spaces within cities of concentrated advantage, surrounded by much larger spans of concentrated disadvantage, and as you move away from the winter cities, more and larger areas of concentrated disadvantage. Um, anyway, I've told you my story. I've told you my story of three cities, of Newark, of Pittsburgh, and Toronto. Um, well, I'm a professor, which means I come from the Fidel Castro School of Public Speaking, and you know that means I could keep you here in this, this lovely room all day. Uh, but I think with that, we're at time or more, uh, and it's time for us to have a conversation with the panel. Thanks for your patience and listening to me. I look forward to this conversation. Thank you for a very personal journey through this, and also I think it was Edward Carr's famous book, What is History? He talked about the moral judgment of historians, but also the historicity of things. So if you really now you get this timeline, one can understand the causality of things, why we are ended up in a second sort of type of urban crisis. So uh, the next segment is, uh, as we have planned it, it would be a number of uh, our colleagues that would uh, reflect and uh, discuss a little bit the work which Richard has done from the creative class to the urban crisis. And I would like to introduce our three colleagues. I can actually start from the physical uh, seating of them. Uh, Professor Hans Westlund, uh, Professor of Urban and Regional Planning at the School of Architecture and Built Environment, but also Professor of Entrepreneurship and Urban Economics at Ian Schepping University here in Sweden. A good friend and colleague of mine and a former head of department uh, is one of the first. Uh, then the second one is uh, uh, architect, uh, our architectural critic and debater, Ulla Andersson of Alfredson and Andersson's uh, uh, architectural firm uh, with the backgrounds in art history and uh, architecture. And I would say one of my most prolific uh, architectural writers. And last but not least, Carrie Facer, a champion for climate change, a champion for, for the better tomorrow. Uh, professor right now, guest professor uh, at Uppsala University, but based in Bristol, uh, uh, will join us also. So we have a very interesting, nice mix and as usual as I do, I try to speak very less, uh, and I, maybe I can intervene, but uh, I would like to hear three of your, and of course, there will be time for Q&A, I promise. I will give a few of you lucky um, winners or losers, depending where you are in the creative class or urban crisis, uh, a chance to talk. So the first reaction maybe from three of you, this very telling story uh, or a comment that you might have. We can start from Yula. I think, as an architect, uh, my job is to uh, um, uh, ask myself how can we produce this kind of uh, environment that is so um, attractive to um, um, uh, people in general. Um, uh, because what I think has happened is that, uh, as you described, in New for instance, in New York, there was 
in Stockholm as well, there was an uh, abundance of urban space um, uh, suitable for this kind of creative class in the end of the 20th century. Um, Stockholm had uh, close to half a million um, inhabitants in the central city in 1944. In 1981, when I moved into the central city, uh, there was 225,000, so there was an abundance of space. And what has happened since I moved in here to the central Stockholm uh, is that the urban, urban um, space has become, uh, uh, gone through this development that you have described. And there, but we, and the result is that there is now a shortage of this kind of, of space. And um, the interesting thing in Stockholm, I think Stockholm is, is sort of ahead of the curve in, in gentrification. And the interesting thing is that the creative, I have watched uh, during the last, say, uh, 20 years or 15 years, how the creative class has been uh, replaced in these urban environments by people with more money than they have. Because, you know, no, um, uh, people who work in, say, uh, actors and people like that can, or journalists and uh, uh, intellectuals can no longer afford to live in the central city. Um, and and the, the reason for this is, of course, economical. They, don't, they can afford it. And uh, uh, to me, that seems like a question of um, supply and demand, that there's a very high demand for this kind of environment, and the supply is fixed, because uh, we haven't been able to produce uh, this, kind of a, this kind of spaces um, anew. Uh, we're stuck with the ones we had in 1945. Uh, and I think that's, that's a big question that um, uh, can we uh, today with our, uh, in our society produce this kind of urban environment and what would it take to do that? And, uh, and the most important question is perhaps what happens if we don't, if this development will continue? Thank you, Lenny. You can reflect right away. Quickly, and then and others can jump in. 100% <laughs> accurate, um, and it's a case of Stockholm that tracks what my own writing in the New Urban Crisis at a more macro level. Um, if people ask me what I got wrong, I say kind of what you said. I completely underpredicted the fact that there would be such an attractiveness to this movement back to the city. I thought it would be very slow. Maybe a little bit more, uh, but what's happened in a Pittsburgh or in a Milwaukee or in a Detroit or in a second city in the United States where we see a similar dynamic, never mind New York and London and Paris. So I think, and I was actually criticized for believing that it would happen in the first place. People thought I was nuts, if mostly heretical for thinking people would move back to these declining urban spaces. Um, in that sense, uh, one point I want to emphasize is that in contrast to the old urban crisis was a crisis of economic dysfunction and failure, the new urban crisis is, is a crisis of the city's success. And that has to be Acknowledge. It is a crisis of the incredible ability of these cities to attract affluent people. Of course, you said something which many of my, you said something that my economist friends agree with, but don't fully understand as you do as an architectural historian and critic. Most of my economist friends who are on the other side of this issue, including my dear friend Ed Glazer, who I admire greatly, if you had asked them back when I wrote Rise of the Creative Class, they would have said, in fact, Ed invented, I think, I called it three T's, technology, talent, and tolerance. He called it the three S's, sun, skills, and sprawl. He said that people would continue to move to suburbia where there was better housing and it was cheaper. Um, now, these same economists have understood that this, what you said had happened, accelerated urban revitalization, which happens after 2000 and particularly after 2010, the evidence we have. And now they're calling for a tremendous increase in density in the urban center by restricting land use uh, restrictions and building codes. What I talk about in the rise of the creative class is that is important but a necessary but insufficient condition because what people are moving back to is not just high-rise towers. They're moving back to a very limited supply of spectacular urban neighborhoods, which we only have a handful of. So when you have rich people and foreign investors and tech companies and multimedia companies and everyone, and those are things that are hard to build. So it won't, it won't simply, even though we have to build more, we have to build carefully. And one thing we can't do is throw the baby out with the bathwater. We cannot, and I see this happening more in U.S. cities, beginnings of the destruction of the architectural fabric 
of these great historic Van Jacobs neighborhoods. So that's one of the things I worry about. We have to build more, and also just the other thing is we have to build not just more supply, we have to put a focus on building more affordable supply for artistic creatives and also for the underclass, uh, the working and underclasses who can't afford to live in these cities, but 100% right on. Okay, you were, you wanted to react. Hmm? So I really enjoyed your talk, I really enjoyed your story. Um, one of the things that um, I wonder whether it's worth introducing is the understory of what has happened to education and to schools over this period, which both in the US and in Sweden has seen a radical privatization of education situations to the point that you get an intensification of the inequalities through the schooling system. So education and schooling seem something that's missing from the narrative, because one of my questions is, how does one make a member of the creative class? And the second area that I'm particularly interested in is the relationship of universities and so-called knowledge workers in universities um, in their connection to other actors in the city. So I think this is it's very interesting, the way that your, your thinking is moving. So I'd like to tell a little story in response to your stories, if that's OK. So I'm, I'm from the city of Bristol. We have a fantastic creative tech sector. We are doing a huge amount on smart cities. We also pride ourselves on being green. We were Bristol, we were European green capital. And what happens, and this is an example that happens frequently, is that the, the tech entrepreneurs and the universities have brilliant ideas of fixing the climate problem, and they go out to the low-income communities, often the communities where people of color live, often the communities where there is less wealth. And they come bringing news of the technological innovation that is going to fix their problems. And the people in those communities will turn around and say, hang on, who are you? Why are you coming here to tell us how to live? I have seen what you spend your money on. I know what you're looking for is something novel and new. So there are, there are computer scientists, for example, who will instrument low-income people's houses in order to get them to reduce their energy usage in a way that they will not allow their own houses to be instrumented. So low-income communities say, the things that I'm worried about is the lack of public transport, is the fact that my house is damp and wet and cold, and therefore I have to use a lot of energy to fix it. So the problems that go to the heart of many of the issues around how to create sustainable cities, because I'm interested in how we create good cities and sustainable cities and fair cities are problems that are often not exciting for the creative class. They're not exciting because they might be a bit boring. They might be a bit about maintenance. They might be a bit about repair. So my question is, is given this community, and I mean, I, I've spent a lot of time working with designers and creators, and I love it, and it's a fun place to be. But my question is, is maybe some of the things that we need to create viable cities that are going to be able to survive in the next 20, 30 years, as we start looking at significant impacts from climate change, are not going to be about searching for novelty. They're going to be about figuring out how we care for people, how we repair things. So how do we get these creatives, if you like, to engage in something more than the search for novelty and to search for a good life and a good society and to figure out how we use those skills to creating a better <coughs> world, not just a cool world. 100% agree. Um, first of all, a big, part, a big part of that starts here. Mm. Uh, the incentives for us are 100% for novelty and 0% for engagement. Yeah. I can tell you I've been promoted in a university like this. When those promotions have come, I've been told, publish more papers that are novel stop doing that stupid work with communities. So number one, the incentive structures of universities need to change. I've been quite outspoken on that. I think they're ruinous. Um, you notice that not many faculty members will write about this. I will write about it. I'm a university professor with tenure. They can't hurt me. Well, maybe they can, but not too badly. So the incentive st structures that we have set up are wrong. Um, we promote, generally speaking, I'm not talking about KTH, based on research, teaching, and service service being departmental service. Um, a number of us have talked about changing that to discovery, learning, and engagement, and giving full credit for engagement. 
we need to have mechanisms that give full credit for real engagement. The second thing is, you know, I'm a, I'm a student and Jane Jacobs was my mentor. And I came to Jane one day after the devastating attack on the World Trade Center in New York City. I could look at those towers being built as a boy. And I said, Jane, we're both New Yorkers, even though I'm from New Jersey and she's from Pennsylvania, we both live there. We have to go help develop the plan for Lower Manhattan. She said, Richard, I love you. You just asked the wrong question. I said, what do you mean? You know, I'm all flustered. The city's under attack, this thing is damaged, we have to go. We're, we're recognized, Jane, you more than me, but I'll go, I'll support you. She said, it's not about what we think, Richard. It's about the people who live there, the people who commute through there, the people who own the shops. And that's what you're saying, that our models of engagement aren't just going there and giving you something. They have to be built from the concerns. And one lesson I learned in Pittsburgh is we had a very poor neighborhood adjacent to the university, East Liberty. And we thought if we brought technology incubators, and we thought if we brought this, and then what did the neighborhood want? Good, low-paying jobs. So when we finally got some investment with a great community development organization, we went to Whole Foods and said, if you're going to locate in this neighborhood, you have to employ local people and you have to provide products. And we did that with everyone. I mean, we had this most remarkable, but, but your point is, it has to be rooted in the local community. And, and that's always been, and, and sometimes when I've been criticized, it's been, well, you haven't prescribed enough. It's because I really do believe you have to get this from the bottom up, and it's part of us engaging communities. The last point, you're 100% right, and of course I live in the country that's the worst on this, because the U.S. has not only privatized education, education is local. So in different, in Canada, where it's a, a statewide or provincial, in the U.S., you, where you live determines your educational outcomes. What I think is even more egregious is the fact now that, that it, it, it multiplies the advantages of location. If you locate in a place, and we see this, you know, the, the competition to be in the right school district or to have your kids, if you can find the right location, you give your kids, and not only are you married to a spouse that multiplies your advantages sort of mating, your locational advantage magnifies, and then I think not only it's post-school, most of you are saying young people can't afford to live in these neighborhoods, they need parents. <laughs> who can help them. When I asked my students at the University of Toronto, I said, who of you gets to live in these kinds of neighborhoods? Well, they said, that's easy, Rich. Those of us who have the bank of mom and dad. So now you have compounded advantages which are highly spatial and localized. From where you're born to where you're educated to who your parents are, then how they can afford to put you in the right university, in the right location for your career maximization. So yeah, I think we're in a situation where locational advantage compounds. And can I also add one thing to that, which is that we are still selling the idea that all, all of that conveyor belt is driven by the idea that if you get out of university, you are then secure. No. And I think we're now at a position where increasingly people are realizing that you get out of university with a degree, it is not going to guarantee your long-term security, your long-term well-being, because the economic competition and precarity is so high. And at the same time, if we think about the young people that we're dealing with today, they are asking questions, how all of this helps us deal with the issue of climate change. So yep. all of this issue is we are material, we are embedded, we use energy. And if we think about the digital landscape, mining one Bitcoin costs you 60 barrels of oil, Training one piece of machine learning costs the equivalent of five lifetimes of a car. So any long-term strategy that is premised on technological innovation and on universities is not only selling something to kids that is not going to deliver on their security, but it's also going to negatively impact on the climate crisis. So two quick things and then... So um, the first one is that... Well, three things. I have little kids two and four. Had kids late in life. I front-loaded my career too much. Um, what I say to my wife is, and, and I want you to hear this from my heart, this is how worried I am. We have to take care of these kids. Like, we have to set up some kind of fund for their life. Like, I'm not kidding. The, I'm so worried about precarity, even though they have every advantage in the world, that they are not going to be able to find a way. And these are some of the most, right? I mean, I'm a professor. I'm here in Sweden, I'm getting an honorary degree from, if I'm worried about my kids, I, that has to be terrifying for someone who's not in my position of advantage. So I think it's a terrifying prospect. And the kids who, who have family support can find things to do that are interesting and engaging. And if they don't, boy, oh boy, it's a tough go. That's number one. And uh, number two, that goes to you. So I work with your colleague, Charlotta Mellander. And uh, so I know a little bit about, and we've been working on, on this urban-rural divide now 
a lot together. And one of the ways out, I think, is that we, have, we can't keep packing people into the Stockholms, to the New Yorks, to San Francisco's. We have, to, we have a whole bunch of people like pit, places like Pittsburgh, the industrial centers of England, great communities in Sweden, which are being rebuilt. And many of them are becoming quite attractive. I'm traveling to many of these small places. I can say if the inflection point I was tracking when I started to write Rise of the Creative Class was the movement towards the empty spaces of the Stockholms and New Yorks and San Francisco's and London's, I can now see the tipping point where people are saying to hell with this. So I think one way to make the world better is to take all of these magnificent places and begin to say, you can make a life. You can afford to make a life. You can get cheaper space. You can engage with the community. And I have many examples of that. And the final thing, going back to knowledge institutions, I mentioned the incentives. One of the things I'm doing in, the, in this part of my career is working with knowledge institutions all across the world to be better community citizens. And I'll give you this one example, one example. When I took my visiting professorship at NYU, I get affordable housing. I get an affordable apartment, and every tenure stream of a professor at NYU or Columbia or Harvard or Stanford gets affordable housing. Well, do you know what the service workers at NYU or Harvard get? You know, the people who clean the toilets, serve the food, take care of those apartments. They get a minimum wage and the long commute. So now, for the first time in the United States, this is actually working. Both our medical centers and educational, eds and meds, are now saying we have to be actors on the front line of affordable housing and on higher pay. So our institutions, not only governmental institutions, but institutions like this have a stake in this and have to help. Uh, you know, moving from micro to macro, and these, this is one of the issues, micro, meso, macro. So maybe you're somewhere there now. Do you want to lift it up? Yeah, I think so. Well, but first of all, uh, thank you for a very, very um, interesting uh, personal, but also very engaged uh, introduction. Um, <clears throat> When I read your book, I, I came to think of a number of issues that uh, can be discussed back and forth. You touched upon several of them, but I, I will say a little about it. First, this about urban crisis. Yeah, you say it's a new urban crisis now, and it is. I agree with that. But still, we have uh, lots of cities in the world still struggling with the old urban crisis, mm -hmm. the suburbanization, the de-industrialization, and so on. So, well, your own hometown, I guess, Newark, uh, Detroit is an infamous example. We have lots of these also in, in Europe, in particular in Eastern Europe. <coughs> um, so I would like to, to then stress the, what I call the knowledge economy, which is, in fact, what is producing the, the creative class then, uh, which is uh, a change, a transformation of society of the same amount as the industrialization did uh, 100, 150 years ago. Uh, we have a new class of new rich, and we have lots of new poor people. Uh, if we look at what industrialization created, we should still be very grateful that so much hasn't happened yet with the knowledge economy. Industrialization created two world wars, communism, Nazism, and fascism. This, these were the reactions to industrialization that so many poor people really couldn't stand what happened. And if we are on this way now with the, the knowledge economy, then we really should think about what to do. So maybe it's a <clears throat> even more, much more general crisis than, than a new urban crisis. Uh, from the other perspective, which I think you also described, that there is this inner city crisis that also Ola was into, that there are now just really the rich people, or increasingly the rich people that can afford to be there, and the, the creative, poorer, guys are being crowded out. So that's, there is really a need, there is, uh, there is an opportunity for planning to create good conditions for creative suburbs, or what we should call them in, in, in the future. Uh, <clears throat> the last thing uh, is also 
you could also ask if maybe this is a post-urban crisis uh, connected to the book that uh, Tegan and I published mm -hmm. almost two years ago, which Richard also <laughs> contributed to. Please buy we this as soon as you can. <laughs> and this book is today published in Japanese. I can also say. Yeah. Uh, well, enough about that. But what we say in this book is very much uh, it's a regional phenomenon. It's metropolitan region, which uh, is also in a hierarchy, and we have those that Richard mentioned that are in the very top. But outside the metropolitan regions, what is there? Well, there is lots of countryside. There are also old industrial cities that no one needs anymore. That's the real thing. We need the resources out there in the countryside, but that, those can be caught by fly-in, fly-out labor and very, very capital-intensive industries that can, soon can be remote controlled. There is no real need for any people out there. This is also a crisis. This is a deep crisis in, in the human community. We have been thinking about urban and rural. Now it's something else. It's post-urban or post-rural. Yeah, let, let me respond, because I think, I think you and I, we think a lot alike. So I can show you my notes. Um, it's very interesting. Um, they're right here and in the first page. In the first page, the opening of the speech I was to give sounded a lot like yours. They're right there. You can look at them. We are living through the greatest disruption in human history. Uh, there was one with the rise of modern farming and one with the rise of modern industry, and industrialization gave rise to this incredibly disruptive time, and I say exactly what you said. Two world wars, the rise of the ism, I mean, it's just like a mind meld. And of course, my father told me about this, because my father lived through the Great Depression and fought in the World War. He stormed the beaches at Normandy, and I was saying last night, couldn't have even imagined what his life was like, that kind of personal disruption. We are very fortunate, indeed, that that this disruption, which is bigger, because all heretofore human history, we made wealth by manipulating nature and using physical labor. Now we've disintermediated that and we make wealth with our heads. And I think that's what's causing the political and cultural backlash that we see in the rise of populism. But I'm optimistic. A couple of points. One, I think that the underlying mechanic, the dynamic at the bottom of this, it's Ed Glazer's professor and a great Nobel Prize winner, Robert Lucas, identified in a classic essay called The Mechanics of Economic Development. And Jane Jacobs, and he said, he said in that essay, Jane Jacobs deserved a Nobel Prize for this. Because this woman, who wasn't an academic, didn't have a PhD, identified something he called a human capital externality. A human capital externality is not a firm-based or resource-based externality. It means when we get together in a city or neighborhood, we make each other more productive and innovative. And he said in a knowledge economy, that's why the people are moving to downtown Stockholm. It's a basic economic law that's forcing us together, closely compacted, because that is the engine of economic growth and development. That's why we get this concentration and clustering. So in this sense, urbanization, we talk about industrialization and urbanization, Urbanization is the more powerful force. It's really fascinating to me that, and urbanization, the industrialization is a relatively short, short period of time, several hundred years. Urbanization is a force that's exerted across all of human history. So now we're dealing with pure urbanization dynamics. So you're 100% right about the crisis, you know. A really talented book editor in New York titled The Creative Class. I didn't want to call it that. And a really titled creative book editor in New York said, you're talking about a new urban crisis, let's call it that. In the book, I say exactly what you said. It's a much more general crisis of knowledge-based capitalism. It is not just a crisis of an inner city. It is a crisis of the fact, here's the crisis. Because of this law of economic development, with more and more of us are forced, are pushed, there's a, there's a mechanism acting on us that push us to concentrate and cluster in inner cities. There's only so much land. The land price shoots up, <laughs> forcing more and more of us out. So it creates an enormous divide and that divide creates a whole set of political backlashes, which now begin to undercut the innovative dynamic. So yeah, I think it's a general crisis of knowledge-based capitalism, but here's why I'm optimistic. I think cities are places of political contest. They're not all yuppie, gentrified, creative class places. There's low-income people, there's middle-income people, there's black people, there's white people, there's ethnic minorities, and people are mad. 
And they go to the mayor and they go to their city council and say, you have to fix this and we can't go on this way. And now we have a political eruption. You know, people are erupting in San Francisco against the tech companies. People are erupting across the world against big real estate developers. There is a real conversation. And my sense of this is the political contest over cities will force us to create new solutions for more inclusivity and more equity. Are we there yet? No, but we're in early days. We're at the beginnings, the equivalent beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, but it heartens me uh, that we've thus far been able to avoid mass-scale global conflict and that we've been able to have a political conversation. Is it resolved? No, and I think, sorry, I think the bigger questions then ultimately revive around sustainability and climate and things that I don't, that I'm not a great expert in, but, but I tend to be optimistic that we can come through this. If we could come through the Industrial Revolution, we probably can come through this. Carrie? Um, my, 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 the obligation of my job title, which is Professor of Climate Change Leadership, is to point out that if we think this is disruptive, we haven't seen anything yet. Yep. Um, we yep. are in a situation where at best, at the moment, we are oh. aiming for two degrees, and two degrees is 45% species loss. It means Southern Europe doesn't look great. That's our best scenario. So at the moment, what we're looking for is planning for four degrees. What does it mean to plan for four degrees heat? This is radical disruption that we're going to have to be facing, not just in other places, here and relatively soon. So I want to suggest that bringing into this conversation, we need to bring the planet, we need to bring nature, we need to bring the physical forces that we're dealing with. And we need to think creatively, we need to figure out how for example, we combine these questions of how we engage with the rural areas, how we bring creativity to those places, but also how we recognize the creativity and the ability to work with the land and materials that already exist in those places so that we're not seeing them just as a deficit, but as people who can also teach us how to live. Because frankly, a lot of us in the creative class are going to be stuffed if we're relying on yes. our skills. We, we right. have to build much, I would love to see a collaboration between KTH and SLU, so the Technical University and the Agricultural University. Yes. How do we think these things together? So really we, we cannot begin to say that what we're dealing with is a radical disruption in terms of the knowledge economy. That is a continuation, if you like, of existing processes. If we take what is happening in terms of climate change seriously, we are seeing a much bigger fundamental change and it changes our sense of who we're working with, who we're collaborating with. We will be collaborating with carbon atoms, with trees, with rivers. What does that mean for how we work and how we live? And we're going to have to figure that out. So I'm not an expert on this I because the problem is so important. I'm glad to know you and others like you. But I, I had a great friend. His name is Ben Barber. Ben unfortunately died. Um, he had the same editor as me. So a great titled book. My editor titled it, If Mayors Rule the World, was his first book. The second book, which is much less read, um, was called Cool Cities. He wrote it right before this died. And it's not about cool cities like with cool bars. Yeah. It's about climate. Yeah. And I don't know the science, and I don't know what you or Ben knows, but what, what he said at the end of that book, this is a guy who's a political theorist and a leading political theorist. He's not a climate change expert. Uh, he's not a cities expert. But what he came to the conclusion was this, and I think this is the bridge between our work. Yeah, yeah that one of the legacies of the industrial age are these national level industries, these national level political parties, and these horrifically powerful nation states. Mm -hmm. Now, he didn't anticipate Donald Trump, but who in their right mind would have get, designed a system that is so top down that one complete lunatic could capture it and wreak havoc? Why wouldn't you design a more robust, decentralized, the most best managed companies, decentralized decision making, Japanese manufacturing, put factory worker decision making in the hands of the workers. Mm -hmm. One of the things he talks about is the need to radically devolve power. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the mayors, I'm not saying they're perfect, but in my country, the mayors have provided literally the only leadership mm -hmm. on climate. So Ben's point was if we begin to devolve power away from these horrifically overly powerful institutions called nation states, and slowly, but and you've actually led in, in the UK, you've done a little better than most other places. That's not perfect. But if you could bring power down and real power, revenue power, you would give people more ability to tailor solutions to their own, and you would build a more resistant, resilient. So I think 
the one mechanism we could work on together is, and the one thing I've been unable to do, is how do we begin to shift power away from the nation state and give it to local communities to begin to address the problems they face? I, this is why I turn to you two, though. How does that, how does that work with an understanding of the rural-urban as a critical relationship and a critical dynamic. So I, I agree, cities are a great scale to work at. The risk is that cities see themselves as, if you like, deconnected from the rural areas. That's precisely what your work is about. So how do we both decentralize and make sure that we remain networked and connected and understand that cities are not, if you like, autonomous people's republics. They're also <laughs> dependent on other places. So let me just say one thing, and then I, I think that Here's where the creative class needs some education. <laughs> that the creative class are the ones, I say this in the 2002 edition, I just wrote that they named it a classic of social science, so I wrote another forward. The creative class must grow up. Yeah. That's, that's what I said in that we, we must not only try to make our places and our communities, we are the advantage class, stop the bullshit, grow up and realize that you need to build partners and help lead across society. Now, I, have, I think that there's several kinds of rural areas. And one of the things I'm working on is this. I'm actually doing research on this, how to recategorize urban, suburban, and rural into different kinds of places, because the categories are clunky. There are a small group of rural places that are doing quite well, you know, that have amenities, that have connections to major metro areas, that are attracting all of these kinds of people because they don't want to live in the city. Uh, there are some places that are doing okay, and there are some places that are falling apart. Mm. And I think it's, we have to figure out, but my hunch is that's through aggressive place-based policy and giving people the tools to solve their own problems. But yeah, the, and also you mentioned suburbs. The other big issue is that more people still live in suburbs than rural areas and urban areas combined. We don't even like to talk about as urban as suburbs, but giving suburbs the tool to begin to retrofit are critical, and we have to do that. That's just part of the agenda. Ula, you would just want to comment. Uh, yeah, I think that you know one of the. I mean, we're roughly the same generation. I think what we saw when you wrote your book in in around the millennium was that we thought that you know this. Um, economic development that was taking place in cities, they would lift all the boats and yeah. everybody would be happier um, for it. But what we, have, what we didn't count on is the uh, uh, well-documented uh, increase in, 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 in the, the, the increasing inequality in, in, on, 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 uh, um, especially in the Western world, um, uh, where the big parts of um, human population in the, th in the third world have seen rising um, uh, incomes and but in, in the Western world the, like the one percent have seen their incomes increase drastically while um, th the other boats didn't get lifted and when that happens of course there is resentment towards the uh, well, to, towards the creative class and I mean the resentment that is represented by uh, Donald Trump is directed at exactly the, the creative class that you wrote about. And um, so I think the, the, this, this, there is no fixing this without addressing the question of inequality. Yeah. Oh, two things just really quickly on that. Um, one, I think there, we now know how inequality is produced. Um, the biggest part of the inequality story is in the 1%. Um, if you look at the data for nearly every country, the people who've made off with most of the surplus are the people in the 1% and above. There is a bigger distribution of income within the 1% than in the rest of the population. So, yeah, this whole creation of an oligarchy class, of billionaires, and that's where people like, in my country, Elizabeth Warren, and others are making, as well as scholars like Thomas Piketty, arguing that we need higher marginal income tax rates and a wealth tax. That's gonna be hard to do, it's gonna take a long time, there's gonna be a lot of opposition. The other part of it is at the bottom. Um, my dad told me a great story. My dad said when he was a boy in the 1930s, it took nine people, his mom and dad and all seven siblings to make a family wage, and it took three families in a townhouse in Newark, my father's father and his two brothers, to support one family. Three families pooling could support one household. So you're talking about roughly 30 people's wages to support one household. 
He said, Rich, I went off and fought in World War II, and I came back and something changed. I went to work in the same factory, doing the same job, except now I had enough money, same job, same factory, to buy a house, to put you boys through Catholic school and put you through university. This was called labor parties, Franklin Roosevelt, social democracy. We made manufacturing work good work. It was the kind of shit that Marx said was horrific, work in satanic mills, people were dying. 50% of Swedes and 50% of Americans work in low-wage, precarious, contingent service jobs. Mm -hmm. Those jobs need to be made better jobs, and that's what I do. I go around the world and the country telling people, you have to build a new middle class by upgrading the people who do service work. And if you don't, you're condemning 50% of your population to low-wage work. Higher minimum wages are part of it, but doing all the things we know work in manufacturing companies, involving people in their work, understanding that better paid workers are more engaged with employees and customers that provide innovation on, in their workplace, that that generates more productivity and more profit. But we've got to make a big push on raising the wages of the 50% of workers who work in the service class. Hans, you want just a short one before I, we have five minutes before I open up a little bit, yeah. To lift a uh, partly other question, because our discussion so far has been <clears throat> focused solely on the Western world, Western cities and so on. But if we look around in the world, there are things happening, uh, more things happening in Asia, East and South Asia. And uh, it would be interesting to hear your opinion on these issues. Is there an urban crisis also there? Is there an urban crisis of another character? Or isn't there a crisis at all? I devote one chat to this question. You know, I have to apologize at the outside, first, for being an American, and, and second, for dealing with American publishers. The, and, and Tyler Brule, who founded Monocle, says this. He said when he took it around to American publishers, they didn't want anything on any city outside of America. I got one chapter. One chapter, and that was a big lift to get one chapter on the world. That's the parochialism of America. Um, Look, I, but I read. It's not my expertise, but I read. Um, we now know that our previous view of urbanization is probably time-limited or incorrect. Our previous view of urbanization, as you know better than me, was that it lifted many boats. That in the West, when England urbanized, when France urbanized, when Europe urbanized, when the United States urbanized, when Japan urbanized, when Korea urbanized, that it went in, hand in hand with an industrial wave people working in factories, getting higher incomes. Uh, agriculture in the periphery moved up. It lifted many, many, yes, there were conflicts, but it lifted urbanization, went along with industrialization and a rising middle class. What we're seeing in, in, the, in, in Asia, in South Asia, in Africa, is that urbanization is highly concentrated in certain megacities, some of which, some of which are creating a middle class, those in China, and maybe, maybe that's it. But in a large number of places, what is so puzzling is that urbanization is being accompanied by declining middle class. And this puzzles urban scholars that what we're getting is poor people's urbanization, urbanization without growth, which you're getting people leaving the countryside, not just for opportunity, but to avoid civil strife, war, crime and violence, environmental catastrophe, and they're packing into cities which are just desperately poor. So, yeah, look, I think this is why it is incumbent on us so what have I done? One, I've gotten in front of the UN. Just talk, I mean, I've gotten in front of the UN and helped convince the UN, one of many, that we needed a sustainable development goal for cities. Not that that's a big deal, but that global level policymakers and global development institutions need to understand that cities and urbanization are important, not just national policy, right, which is, was the mindset. The second thing that we did, so when I went to the UN, you can read the speech, I said, all the grand challenges you face, including climate, are nested in cities. We do not have a support infrastructure for cities. We do not have a training infrastructure. People going into these positions in cities throughout the developing world don't have the kinds of training. So what we did at the University of Toronto is we created a school for cities, the first one in the world. The idea being that what has happened in the medical field, where you develop research and develop clinical protocols and you test that and you have teaching hospitals, but I can tell you this has been really hard. Um, the level of support for cities and city building is minuscule, given the crisis we face. So I think it's incumbent upon us to really build institutions that not only help us in the advanced world, but help build stronger and more vibrant communities throughout the world. And that's going to take a big push by the advanced countries to help make that happen. The last confusion. Okay, so, um
Um, so I want to pick up on that slightly. I just want to say, I think as we're thinking about cities, linking climate justice and social justice together is absolutely essential. So these things aren't against each other. They are, they are part and parcel of the same thing. The 1% you're talking about are also the highest emitters, okay? The, te the top 10% of the global population are producing 50% of the lifestyle emissions. That also includes us. So that's the first thing. The second thing I want to say is I want to talk about women. I want to talk about the fact that we don't just pluralize urbanism by looking to other countries. We also ask the question, well, what would happen if women ran cities? That's very, very rarely discussed. And I think some of the work that's going on in Barcelona starts to show that when women run cities, very different questions get asked, much less about mega projects, much less about engineering, a lot more about how you build relations of care and repair and stewardship. And these are the sorts of things that we also need if we're going to think about climate change. So I just, in, as the only woman on the panel, <laughs> maybe, maybe the only woman, but not the only feminist here. So let me, let me respond. Mm, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. I've heard that a lot in Sweden, is all I can say. Especially as a father, especially as a father of two girls. Um, two girls. Uh, I think you're 100% right. 100% um, right. And we need to pay a great deal of attention to this so that the world in which my kids grow up is better, different and better. But I think we have another alliance between us. Many. Another alliance. I think that your work on justice is an important pillar, and I believe in it wholeheartedly. But I've taken a different narrative tack, and it's, but I believe in it. I've taken a different narrative tack, and I made it explicit. Sometimes I'm called a neoliberal because of this. I've made an argument about competitiveness. I made an argument about competitiveness and prosperity because that's what many of these decision makers, that's how they think. Mm. That's how the corporate community thinks. That's how the business community thinks. That's how the people who run universities think. That's how the people who run nations think. And what I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to do, is suggest that in that narrative of competitiveness and prosperity, a critical component is justice that they're not at odds with one another, that, that, that societies, and the reason I believe this is, I've studied pretty deeply the history of social revolution. It's what I studied as an undergraduate when I was trying to be a rock star. And I studied the birth, birth of social democracy pretty closely. I saw what happened in Germany, and I saw what happened in Russia, and I studied that. And there was a German social democrat, I think he had some influence in, in Sweden, called Karl Kautsky and he called it reform, not revolution. And the idea being that at the forefront of capitalism, you have to be careful. And you can see how dodgy this is even in the United States. That, that you can make an argument about justice and the need for justice, but you can make it in the context of reforming the system. That's been my compromise with myself. I'm not saying it's the right one, it may be the wrong one. But there, to do that, you need vigorous critics and vigorous political opposition from the social justice and, and civic left. And I think therein is the united front. If you ask me where the united front has to go, it has to be an argument about inclusive prosperity and justice and how do we build stronger, more innovative, more sustainable, and more equal societies. Um, that's been my, just to be honest with you, that's been my narrative choice and that's the way I've driven it, but it can't be done without a real concern for social justice. I just want to ask one small thing, and actually, Richard, you lifted it up, one thing we maybe haven't touched upon, and that is which Robert Bruegman calls it the anti-suburban crusade. When Joe Kotkin and um, uh, Alan Berger published a huge book, Influence Suburbia, with 75 essays, and it's the wonderful book about that one, is 50% 50, 50 women, 50% men have written, and a lot of also social justice researchers, they say the biggest urbanization is happening in suburbia, in these peripheral areas, and this is where the big ticking bombs are going to be of all kinds. And I think you've touched a little bit now that you're looking through the nomenclature and also through the definitions. Uh, maybe just your, just your short reflection on that. Joe Kotkin and I were serious enemies. I mean, serious enemies, fighting viciously. And I wrote him a note, I don't know, I wrote him a note one day and said, Joel, you may be my enemy, but I gotta be honest, I don't agree with you on everything. But I've learned more from our conversation than just about anything in my life. And he wrote back immediately, he said, but Richard, you don't understand, I ride my bike to work every day. <laughs> and we've become really, really close friends. Um, they're 100% right, that urbanists in particular have ignored suburbia and I think you meant look down their noses at suburbia or rural areas. 
um, the, the largest number of people live in suburbs. And remember, urbanization isn't just a process of intensification. Urbanization is a process of intensification and densification and extensification. Right? As we've developed, we've developed from small walking cities to horse car cities to streetcar cities to car cities to now transit light rail connected cities, a mega region. So we've developed from small to large, intensive and extensive. Um, if I were going to write a book, I might write a book about suburbia. I think it would be, if you think about all the books on urbia, there are very few on suburbia. So I think you're right in, in that suburbia needs a focus and the mentality of suburbanites. We know, I can give you one fact, because we've been working on these definitions, density-based definitions, connectivity-based definitions. At City Lab, when we broke out the US into a set of dense, six density classifications, from urban to rural and all in between, we found that the hinge points in American political life, the things that swing elections aren't states, but they're kinds of densely to less densely populated things we call suburbs. So the whole political turning point, inflection point in societies, the areas of political debate are really in the suburbs. So yeah, we need a lot more work on that. Okay, wonderful. Uh, let's give a warm hand of applause to all oh, four of our colleagues here.